gentlemen, salamu alaikum. I'd like to welcome you guys uh, to episode 84 of, you know, uh, I don't have to re-mention it for, for 84 times. It's episode 84 of hashtag LNT. Uh, and you read right, yeah, the watch behind me does say 1030. So you guys are in for a treat. We are live in the holy city of Karbala. Uh, and you know, before the show, you guys uh, saw how people uh, in the UK and around the world, how they celebrated Eid Al-Ghadir and how they wished you a wonderful Eid Al-Ghadir, Eid Allah al uh, And I hope you guys had a wonderful Eid uh, for those who were celebrating it. Uh, great day for you guys. But uh, tonight, uh, we're trying to talk about a topic that occurred on the same day, if not a day later. Um, on the 19th of the Hajjah, uh, a massacre happened in this very holy city. Believe it or not, I didn't know until yesterday that this actually happened. And unfortunately, I didn't know about it, but alhamdulillah, tonight we got to tell you guys what happened 200 years ago. But let's go check out what's trending and come back to you very, very short. Again, we welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, th th that was a bit quick, uh, but we do welcome everyone uh, joining us tonight. Now, when the city that never sleeps, sometimes it pays just to get a little uh, rest of eyes, if you will. Uh, but uh, people nowadays are trying to pay just for, uh, for a shut eye. Uh, a nap store in New York paying $25 just to get a 45-minute nap. You know, it's a, it's a treat, you know, subhanAllah, I don't know if these guys don't have any houses or what, what's going on, but you pay $25 just to get a 45 dollar, uh, 45 minute sleep. Now, uh, aside from it being a sleep store, it's also a promotion for a New York based uh, mattress brown, uh, brand uh, that's also there to show you how comfortable the mattress is and then you can buy it later on. Now it's not it's 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 not just the only one that's providing um, you know naps for money. Other stores are also providing it, but it ranges from fifteen to fifty dollars depending on the time you want to spend uh, you know in that nap. Even sleep is now bought with money. Subhanallah, in a few years the oxygen we breathe is going to cost us money. But anyways, let's go jump into tonight's topic. <laughs> Now sadly, several holy places in the world have a history of attacks and desecrations. The criminals that commit these horrific attacks, which usually don't just inflict material damage, but at the same time also result in the loss of lives. For example, we have the evangelical church in uh, Shanxi, China, that was demolished with explosives. Then you have the Jewish synagogues that were destroyed by the Nazis. And then you have the Hindu temples that were also destroyed throughout history. Basically, most religious sanctities have got a hit throughout history. Either demolished once or twice throughout history, and there's no doubt about that. But tonight, we want to focus on heaven on earth, the holy city of Karbala. The city where... You know, my colleague Ay Jassim and I left and stayed here without, you know, staying in any other country. The holy city has been attacked and uh, desecrated by criminals for, you know, multiple times. If you go through our history, multiple times Karbala has been uh, attacked. But there's one incident and there's one attack that we're trying to highlight tonight. And that's why... We've gathered everything when you give you one question to think about for tonight. Your question for tonight is simply in three, two, one. What do you know of the International Day of Karbala's Oppression? What do you know about this International Day? International Day of Karbala's Oppression. Very simple. If you do know what happened, give us a call. Share us a text message, a voice message. Where and how? The numbers popping up in very very short time plus nine six four let's pop up the the phone number all right all right it's lagging tonight it's all good plus nine six four seven seven four zero six seven eighteen thirty six uh and you can uh call us at that number and let us know what you guys uh think about tonight's 
uh, question. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the question for tonight is, what do you know about the International Day of Karbala's oppression? Uh, you do let us know via that number, phone number shown uh, right there. Let's take a quick break and come back to you guys very short. Once again, we do welcome everyone joining us tonight. Now, before the break, we were talking about some of the incidents that did happen in history and other religions uh, who did have their sanctities destroyed uh, by criminals and so on and so forth. Now, the destruction of the holy sh shrines or site uh, belonging to any religion or faith is unacceptable by all faiths. You won't see a Muslim happy well, it's not radical, but you won't see a Muslim happy if, if a Christian gets destroyed, if, if a church gets destroyed. You won't see a Christian being happy if a mosque gets de destroyed. Now in the West, we see when someone gets killed, they stand side by side, unless you come from a Wahhabi uh, background, then we have no discussion. But before we talk about tonight's question, it's worthy to mention some background information about these groups of criminals, also known, AKAs, the Wahhabis that are still present even in today's world. You know, uh, you know th th these savages, I don't know how they, you know, uh, compete with today's technology, but you know, they, they, subhanAllah, they do. But, who have no respect for any religion, any faith, and they don't have respect for the religion, they so call themselves follow it. They have a history of destroying mosques, churches, temples, and other places of worship. You know, in addition, we can't really forget that the, the killing of thousands of innocent individuals, uh, you know, that were just uh, having a good time chilling, if they will. And then you have the Wahhabis coming in and killing them. You know, for more than two centuries, Wahhabism has been Saudi Arabia's dominant faith. You know, it's a radical form of Islam that insists on their literal interpretation of the Quran. Strict Wahhabis believe that all those who don't practice their form of Islam are enemies. And here we see the, cre the creators and you know, the, the so-called officials uh, of Wahhabis. You know, you got the senator right there, you got the head of parliament, uh, and you know, you got, and then and you got the big boss sitting down, Al Saud. Uh, you know, uh, we don't want to give him any credit, but you know, anyways. You know, as you might, let's continue talking what we're talking about. So Wahhabism. The main hub, if you will, of Wahhabism is Saudi Arabia. But you can find its roots in some African countries, in some uh, South Asian countries as well. Now, if you're wondering on who established this, not, you can just write Wahhabism on Google and I'll tell you everything. But just to keep it short, Muhammad ibn, Ab Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, aka Abdul Wahhab, settled in the Middle Eastern part of Saudi Arabia, which happens to be the birthplace of the royal family that's, that's ruling Saudi Arabia right now. Now he's the second guy to the left, so basically right there, the guy that looks like Astaghfirullah, I don't want to say something on national television, but you know, get that picture out of my face. But anyways, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, inspired by the teachings of Ibn Taymiyyah, who is known to be a radical by all schools of thought. You know, if you go to Sunnism, they consider Ibn Taymiyyah to be a radical. But Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and Ibn Taymiyyah were against any practices they considered as polytheistic according to their belief and mentality. What were they? Well, number one, they say beseeching Allah through saints and prophets, praying on clay tablets, practices of rituals and sacrificial offerings, and visiting any grave of any pious individual. You sum those up, you get a Shia. So they're basically against anyone that follows these. And subhanAllah, half of them are mentioned, if not all, are mentioned within the Qur'an. So I don't know what kind of literal teaching they're trying to take from the Qur'an. Now, Karbala, on the other side, one of the holiest cities in the world, and that's undeniable. Human home to the Prophet's grandson was attacked on a day of Ashura by Yazid and his armies. Everyone knows that in a few weeks we'll have Ashura and Karbala. On 680 AD, now about 12 
hundred years later, the holy city of Karbala was attacked by Wahhabis. Now allow me to tell you the story of Karbala second massacre. Just a few days ago, we on Thursday, we had Eid al-Ghadir, the greatest Eid, the festival of all. Everyone is happy because the Prophet's cousin and son-in-law, Imam Ali al-Talib, peace and blessings be upon him, was named as a successor of Prophet Muhammad by the command of Allah. Now this is all good. Everyone's celebrating. It's a good day. The greatest Eid. Everyone's having fun. However, despite it being named the greatest Eid and the most festive of all, it does have a bitter side to it for the people of Karbala. On that day, 1200 years later, in the year 1802 AD, a large group of what a large group of about 12,000 Wahhabis, headed by the Saudi king of that time, Saud bin Abdul Aziz, son of Abdul Aziz bin Muhammad, marched from Saudi Arabia towards Karbala with the aim of destroying the two holy shrines in it, as because to them this is considered as a polytheistic place of worship. People, as they believe, people when they come to these shrines, they worship the shrines instead of worshiping God. What kind of mentality? I don't know. But they massacred thousands of people on that day. Thousands. And to be precise, 7,000 people were massacred and killed on that day. Seized large quantities of donated loot, including gold, Persian rugs, money, pearls, and guns that had been safeguarded in those holy shrines. And, you, and here we can see it's a drawing uh, and, and of how they were entering the holy city uh, of Karbala. Now some may start wondering why this specific day uh, and, and so on and so forth. Why choose this day to come to Karbala? You can choose any other day to come and attack this place. But why this specific day, Eid al-Ghadir? Now everyone knows that on this day, on this specific day, all the Shia, everyone, whether they're in Karbala, whether they're somewhere else, now people come from thousands of miles away just to come to Najaf to celebrate this auspicious day near the Holy Shrine of Imam Ali, peace and blessings be upon him. So they chose this day as an easy getaway for them to get into the city. Not a lot of men are there, not a lot of people are there, so it was easy for them to get into the city. When they left, eyewitnesses, as we're going to talk about them later on, the, they said that the attack lasted for eight hours and when they left they took 4,000 camels carrying their plunder so imagine the kind of spoils to them you know what kind of gold and what kind of uh, riches they got out of Karbala now Alam al-Amini one of the most credible Islamic scholars and very known well Islamic scholar Shia Islamic scholar he states, and I quote, the Wahhabis entered the holy city of Karbala with great difficulty, and then they killed people and destroyed the buildings of the two holy shrines of Imam Hussein and his brother Abu al-Fadl Abbas, peace and blessings be upon them, looting valuables and then setting fire to those holy shrines. Now imagine what Karbala was going through. I mean, if you just imagine, for those who have come to Karbala, close your eyes and imagine the place you were standing in, Bin Haramain Karbala, the two holy shrines, being destroyed and lit on fire. You know, what would be your reaction? Now we would call it inhumane. But surprisingly, those people were still in the government who did that. Now, according to an eyewitness account, J.B. Rose Rousseau, in his description of the historical note on the Wahhabis, Paris. 1809, the events that transpired are as following, and I quote, We have recently seen a horrible example of the Wahhabi's crucial fanaticism and the terrible fate of the mosque of Imam al-Hussein. Incredible wealth was stolen and thousands were killed by Wahhabis. 12,000 of their men suddenly attacked the mosque of Imam al-Hussein after seizing more spoils than they had ever seized after their greatest victories. They put everything to fire and sword the elderly, women, and children. Everybody died by the barbarian sword. Besides, it is said that whatever 
whenever they saw a pregnant woman, they disemboweled her and left her fetus on the mother's bleeding corpse. Their cruelty could not be satisfied. They did not seize their murders, and blood flowed like water. As a result of the bloody catastrophe, thousands of people perished. The Wahhabis carried off their plunder on the backs of 4,000 camels. If you want to see where this is written, you can go back to Rousseau's uh, description, page 74 to 75. You'll find the whole article there and the whole eyewitness testimony in that, in that article uh, on these two pages. Now, we all know that whatever happened on the day of Ashura is horrific. And everybody agrees that whatever happened on that day will never come back again. But if I told you, you know, right now we witnessed ISIS, correct? We just went over the, the, the era of ISIS. Hopefully they don't come back. The people who saw the criminal, uh, the, the, the catastrophes and, and the beheadings and, and the burning and the burying alive and shooting in, in uh, blank spots and throwing off buildings and so on. So imagine that cruelty and that savagery 200 years ago and imagine it 1200 years ago. You know, people don't change. It's the time that changes. You know, yes, 1,200 years ago, Hussein was, was beheaded. Yes, but the same hearts that behead him are now beheading, are, are, are beheading innocent civilians nowadays. It's the exact same. So don't think that this is, you know, crazy and, and, and it's nonsense. Absolutely not. When you have an eyewitness saying that when, whenever they saw a pregnant woman, they disemboweled her and left the fetus on the mother's bleeding corpse. You know, what kind of individual would actually do that nowadays? You know, if someone now at school swears at someone and hits him, they're going to think he's savage. You know, why, why is he doing that? If he keeps on bullying others, people will start giving, you know, throwing out names at him. Yet, subhanAllah, these individuals who you know, ended the lives of not just women, but their fetus, their babies. They killed little children, elderly. So imagine, imagine what Karbala went through at that time. Therefore, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq al Hussein al-Shirazi has recommended and has set the day of the 19th of the Hajjah of every year so that's one day after Eid al-Ghadir. So because they, um, they, they, they don't want uh, the Shia to mourn a day on Eid al-Ghadir because it is Allah's greatest Eid. Um, so they chose the day after it, the 19th, which a lot of narrations do say that this is when it occurred. But on the 19th of the Hijjah, as the international day of Karbala's oppression. This is very important. Number one, it keeps us you know, you know, it keeps reminding ourselves of what actually happened in this land. You know, if you go to ask any native citizen of, a, of, of any country, they'll narrate you the history, they'll narrate you the, the, the wars, the fights, everything. They know everything about their city. But subhanAllah, honestly, I've asked a few people about this today. You know, that, that, that they've been in Karbala, they live in Karbala, their ancestors are from Karbala. I asked them, like, yo, what happened 200 years ago? They're like, what? What happened? I don't know. You know, so we have to really educate ourselves. I didn't know, and to be honest, you know, it's good to say that I don't know. I didn't know this, uh, you know, for, for a couple of days ago when we were talking about the topic. So imagine, you know, uh, what, imagine everyone knew what actually happened in Karbala. The echo it would have on social media, would have on TV, and that's why we have our scholars telling us that today, the 19th of the Hajjah, we, sh we need to set a day, and they have 19th of the Hajjah be the International Day of Karbala's Oppression, because we can't let an oppression like this pass by, and a tragedy pass by and be forgotten. So this is one very important 
uh, point to mention. And until today and until now, the perpetrators, a.k.a. Ali Saud, have not publicly said anything about this tragedy and have not returned anything from the stolen goods and from the stolen riches that they've taken from Karbala. You know, as a matter of fact, they've only given weapons to those uh, terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, you know, and, and other terrorist groups to come and kill the Shia in Karbala. And trust me when I say, Muhammad Hussein said this 1400 years ago, we say it today. The Shia of Muhammad Hussein will never disappear. We're, we're going to multiply and multiply and multiply, get that Shia company working. Uh, at the end of the day, I would like to remind everyone that, you know, let's keep the day uh, of 19th al Hajjah, a day where we can remember Karbala and remember what happened in this holy city. Let's hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, shows us His mercy uh, and, and helps us uh, to continue serving the Ahl Bayt. We do remind everyone uh, to, do, to tune in uh, for uh, tune in for the upcoming episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, 10:30 uh, p.m. Karbala time. And if you do have a topic on your mind, be sure to let us know by sending us your suggestions uh, at the phone number shown below. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.